Good morning, everybody. Isn't hindsight a wonderful thing? All my life you have been faithful. Can you look back at your life and uh, make that confession? Yeah. Now, without hindsight, can you, can you say it about the future? All my life you will be faithful. What great confidence we can have. Um, my computer's just looking for my face, so excuse me while I do strange things in front of it. Yeah, it's all right, it's found me. <laughs> uh, let's pray as we come to God's word. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you that uh, like the father in the story of the prodigal son, you, you stood there at the gate watching and waiting for us. And when you saw us, you ran and embraced and forgave. Father, uh, thank you that you don't wait for us to get our act together. You come to us while we're still sinners, while we're still acting as your enemies. Uh, you sent your son to pay the ultimate price to demonstrate to us once and for all the fullness of your love. And uh, we pray that uh, as you speak to us through your word this morning, you would be again uh, building us up, encouraging us and conforming us to the image of your son. Hearing that call to love one another even as he loved us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I'm going to read this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses... Uh, 1 to 20, if you would like to read along, I'll be reading from the ESV translation. Pursue love and earnestly desire the, gift, the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For the one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? If even lifeless instruments such as the flute or the harp do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? And if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? So with yourselves, if with your tongue you utter speech that is intelligible, how... Uh, sorry, I left a word out. If with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into the air. There are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker a foreigner to me. So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, but my spirit and my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful, what am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will also sing with my mind. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say? Amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you are saying. For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil but in your thinking, be mature. Um, we have been talking about the mature body of the church. 
Let's go right back to the beginning all over again. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 28 and 29, Paul says, Him, Christ, we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Now, this is all repetition. You already know most of this, and that's, that's great. But there are, there are two aspects to a person's maturing. The maturing of the mind and the maturing of the body. Um, Paul talks here about presenting everyone mature in Christ. Mature, complete, perfect, finished. They're the different ways that we can translate this word. And in the ancient world, the, the complete person, the finished perfect, mature person is the wise person. Now that's actually key to the story of the Bible right back in Genesis 1, 2 and 3. The key question is, where will you get that wisdom from? And we know, of course, that the answer is we get wisdom from God. We listen to his word and live by it. So that wisdom begins with faith because without faith, if you don't trust God, you won't listen to anything that he says. And that faith then gives rise to our hope, the hope of eternal life, the resurrection of the body, um, the hope of our own sinlessness being perfected and conformed to the image of God's Son. And this hope that we have is not a wish. This hope is an absolute certainty because God is working in us by his Spirit and by faith he has already justified us. And what that then does, once that hope is a certainty, it sets us free from worrying about ourselves, worrying about our own justification, our own salvation, and it sets us free to love. And, and as we've been hearing over communion this morning, when we learn to love self-sacrificially, love one another even as I have loved you, then God is already at work in us, perfecting us, bringing us to maturity and conforming us to the image of his Son. Now, when we looked at this word present, to present everyone mature in Christ, and we saw the way that Paul uses this word in uh, some of his other letters, we found that the origin of this idea seems to come from Ezekiel chapter 16, where Ezekiel has a, a vision of Israel um, as a discarded, unwanted female infant left in a pool of her own blood to die by the side of the road. And God sees her, feeds her, nurtures her. Um, in that chapter, we have a description of the physical maturing of the body. She is washed, which is sanctification, clothed, which is glorification. And then Israel is presented to God as his bride, perfect through the splendor that he had bestowed on her. And the end goal of presenting the bride to the groom, well, for that we need to go all the way back to Genesis where we see humanity made in the image and likeness of God, both male and female, and commissioned in this way, blessed in this way, to be fruitful and to multiply, to fill the earth and subdue it. So Paul uses this image of the body to describe the, the church four times in his letters and the idea is that he wants to present the church mature as the bride to Christ so that in the union of Christ in his church, they are fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. So this image, oh, I think we've got the wrong one up there, Luke. I don't know what this one is. Um, is it, uh, which one did you... Oh, what have I done? That's all right. You're just going to have to listen to me and look at the nice picture. Um, when we look at the way Paul has used uh, this image of the body in 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, which we're going to finish off today, next week we'll look at Romans 12, um, Ephesians 4 and 5 and Colossians 1 and 3, um, on every occasion that he uses this image... Oh, there we are. We're all sorted. 
and I've got control again. Uh, look, we have um, the word perfect or mature used every time in connection with this Im image of the body. Um, we have, following on that pattern that we see in Ezekiel 16, we have the sanctification of the church mentioned. Um, and then we have the word love, agape, as well as a description of love in action. And on three of the four occasions, uh, we also have mention of the spiritual gifts. And here is the glorification of the church. Um, in Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 and 8, uh, we hear these words, "'Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, "'for the marriage of the Lamb has come "'and his bride has made herself ready. "'It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, "'bright and pure, for the fine linen "'is the righteous deeds of the saints.'" So when we love each other, when that love is taking its full expression, when we are living self-sacrificially, using our gifts in service to one another, then the church is glorified in all of that. And so the end result is that the church is presented to Christ as his bride and in their union uh, they are fruitful and multiply and the, the mission of the church um, becomes effective. Now, what is it that threatens the maturity of the body? And the answer would simply be the immaturity of individuals. The refusal to grow up into a godly wisdom which finds its ultimate expression in self-sacrificial love. Now, there are those in the church whose faith may very well be genuine but who nevertheless insist that, well, it's all about me. And as we go through the letter to the Corinthians, we see this working itself out in a number of ways. Uh, Paul has been addressing these issues one at a time. He talks about divisions in the church as people align themselves behind certain teachers. I follow Paul, I follow Peter, I follow Apollos, I follow Christ, the super spiritual ones. Um, there are uh, lawsuits between believers who, that are being played out in the public eye. There's sexual immorality in the church. Uh, and then in chapters 8 to 10, he deals with the whole issue of, of eating meat that's being sacrificed to idols. In chapters 12 to 14, this is where he deals with the issue of spiritual gifts. And it looks very much like there are some people in the church that are boasting about their gifts as if the gifts that they have in particular make them more spiritual than others. Um, while he's talking about spiritual gifts, what, what he's really talking about is the unity of the body. And there's a very sad irony that the gifts that are given for the unity of the body are in fact causing divisions because of their immaturity. But as we come to this section, Paul is drawing together all of the principles that he's already been teaching in the letter as he deals with these other issues. And here's just a couple that we've already had a quick look at. Back in chapter 6, uh, Paul is talking about sexual immorality in the church and he says this where he introduces this idea of uh, the church as the body. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ, and here members is being used not in like where you have membership in a local congregation, but members as in your, the fingers and hands and arms and legs, the members of the body, the bits that make up the body. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. Now, as long as, along with this idea of the corporate body of the church, Paul introduces an idea here that's a little bit confronting and, and a bit foreign to us, the idea of corporate sin. You see, when you as a Christian join to the body of Christ, engage in sinful behaviours, you can't disentangle yourself from the body for that moment. You take the rest of the body with you. At the end of that chapter, uh, Paul goes on to say this, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Uh, now, verse 19 there, there's a bit of 
debate about how it should be understood. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? The NIV translates that to make it sound like your bodies each individually are temples of the Holy Spirit. Um, But uh, do you not know that your, is plural, body is singular, is a temple singular of the Holy Spirit within you, plural? And so I think probably the better way to understand it is that you corporately are the body, uh, are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're not your own, you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Over in chapter 8, as Paul begins this conversation about eating food sacrificed to idols, he then says this, Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. Um, He says something interesting there in the second verse. He doesn't say, you do not yet know what you ought to know. He says, you do not yet know how you ought to know. Um, What does he mean by that? Do you remember the knowledge that he's talking about? When When we looked at this, it's a little bit shocking, isn't it? Because the knowledge that people are being puffed up with is this. There is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. That's really good knowledge. The problem isn't what they know. The problem is how they know. What do I mean by that? Well, if we go back to the third verse, he writes this, but if anyone loves God, he is known by God. How ought you to know as one who is known by God? And if we're honest with ourselves, well, if God knows me, I'm either in serious trouble or I'm going to be completely dependent on his grace. To be known by God must cause us to be humble. I don't stand before God because of my own righteousness. I don't come because of my great knowledge and understanding. I come only because of his grace. To be known by God means to have all of your sinfulness exposed before him. So how should I know that there is one God and one Lord Jesus Christ in all humility? Which means I won't berate and humiliate others because they don't share that same knowledge. Instead, in mercy and in grace and in patience, I'll work hard to build them up in the truth. So this is some of the background as we come to this discussion on spiritual gifts which begins in chapter 12, and I hope that you remember that as he starts this conversation, he starts by laying out a basic principle. While the gifts of the Spirit are manifestations of the Spirit given to each individual, the gifts are not proof of the Spirit's presence. The proof that the Spirit is in a person is in the confession of Christ as Lord. I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So he goes on to describe the church as the body. Every member as important as each other, each contributing to the whole so that the body functions properly. No one has all of the gifts except that when you belong to the body, you have access to all of the gifts through each other. Um, The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. And there's a a hint here really of 
the kind of problem that's going on in the church. Some seem to be acting as if the gift that they have has brought them to a spiritual perfection so that I have no longer any need of others. Um, He finishes this whole conversation by saying, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, gifts of healing, helping, administration and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all possess gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret? And the answer to all of those questions is, of course, no. And then he finishes with these words. Earnestly desire the higher gifts and I will show you a still more excellent way. And the more excellent way, which really is the way of maturity, is the way of love described in chapter 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. Now that sounds a little bit like what we heard in chapter 8 verse 1, isn't it? Love builds up, knowledge puffs up. So what good is it if I understand all mysteries and have all knowledge but have not love? The answer is, it's no good at all. It's of no benefit. It's only love that makes the gifts and our understanding and our knowledge of any benefit in the church. So in humility, we need to acknowledge that our knowledge is incomplete and that That knowledge will only be made complete, if you know the rest of the chapter, when will it be made complete? When we see Christ face to face. Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So it brings us back to that that idea of humility. As Christians, we are perpetual students this isn't a course that you ever graduate from until that day when we stand in his presence and see him face to face we keep coming back to his word and letting it shape us and inform us now as we move into chapter 14 he really gets to the crux of the matter of the disunity in the body and he starts that conversation like this Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Can you see the parallels between the end of chapter 12 and the beginning of chapter 14? Earnestly desire the higher gifts and I will show you a still more excellent way. Pursue love, which is the more excellent way, and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts especially that you may prophesy. Why prophesy? Earnestly desire the higher gifts, earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Why has Paul elevated prophecy to, well, effectively, the highest of the spiritual gifts? Uh, Well, we need to ask this, perhaps. First of all, what is prophecy? Prophecy. Um, sometimes as Christians we can have a very pagan understanding of some of these concepts. Prophecy is not predicting the future. Um, A prophetic word might involve the future, but that's not the point. What is a prophet? We really get our biblical definition of a prophet from Exodus chapter 4, where God has uh, spoken to Moses and tells him to go and speak to Pharaoh. Uh, But Moses isn't very happy about this idea. And he says to God, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. And the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? 
Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. But Moses again has a whinge and he says, Oh my Lord, please send somebody else. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, and, and this is lovely because he's in his anger, he's actually very merciful. Um, is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people, and he shall be your mouth, and you shall be as God to him. Aaron will be your prophet, and you will be as God to him. You will put the words in his mouth. So what is a prophet in the biblical sense? A prophet is simply somebody that speaks the word of God. Now, this little story here about the speaking the word of God gets picked up. Um, oh, there are the words there. Um, later on in the story of the Exodus, uh, at the foot of Mount Sinai, oh, if I've got my context right, you might want to correct me on that, um, there's a point in the story where Moses is just overwhelmed by all the grumbling and complaining of the people. And so he goes to God and says, I need some help. Please give me some help. And so God tells Moses to appoint 70 elders from among the nation. Um, and then those 70 are called to a meeting uh, at the tabernacle. And we're told that the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And as soon as the spirit rested on them, they prophesied. But they did not continue doing it. Now two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the Spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. In other words, uh, the 70 have come to the tent of meeting and, and they've prophesied for a, for a moment, but there are these two, and so they're out with all of the other people, and so the people are hearing these two prophesy. And Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' right-hand man, the assistant of Moses, uh, from his youth, said, The Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Oh, I would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. So all the way back here in, in the, the, the birth of the nation of Israel, there's this desire that all of God's people would speak God's word. This prophecy then has an echo in this prophecy in Joel chapter 2. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and you, your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. Now, Peter tells us that this is fulfilled at Pentecost. When God's spirit is poured out on the apostles and they prophesy. How do they prophesy? Well, they don't predict the future. They stand in front of the crowds and they proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And 3,000 people heard it and believed. In other words, on that day, the fledgling church united to Christ, filled with his spirit, were fruitful and multiplied. And they began filling the earth with those who submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. So why would Paul prefer that we prophesy really above anything else? Because he wants God's people to be people that are filled with his word and speak it. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For the one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the spirit. 
On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. Upbuilding. We've already heard that word, haven't we? Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Builds up is the language of architecture. It describes the construction of a building. And so what we have here then is a, a parallel image to that of the body. And that is the church is a temple. Um, so 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, you might be familiar with these words. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So these parallel images, Christ as the head of the body, Christ as the cornerstone as we are being built up into a temple. Now, as I've mentioned, the issue here seems to be that there are some who speak in tongues who are boasting about their gift as if it was more spiritual than the other gifts. And Paul really is putting these people and their gift back in its place. I don't mean he's beating them down. I mean, quite literally, he's trying to put them in their place so that the body functions properly. Now, as we read, listen to the number of times Paul speaks about building up. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now, I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy, because the one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. So here is really the word, that Paul's bringing to the church. Stop seeking your own glorification and work for the glorification of the church so that Christ might be glorified through it. In 1 Corinthians 13, faith, hope and love remain and the greatest of these is love. But in 1 Corinthians 13 also, prophecies, knowledge and tongues pass away. And so it would seem in chapter 14 that the least of these is tongues. Why? Not because it's any less, not because it doesn't really belong in the body, but because apart from the interpreter, the tongues only gift up, uh, only build up the one that's speaking, whereas the other gifts build up the church as a whole. Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? Unless you understand what I'm speaking in a tongue, what good is that tongue to you? Then he gives this little metaphor. If even lifeless instruments such as the flute or the harp do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? And if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? If you don't know what's being said, how will it benefit anyone? Um, <laughs> I just had a thought pop into my head. Um, whether you're speaking in tongues or not, sometimes as Christians we speak in such Christianese jargon that it's almost as if we're speaking in tongues. We create our own language which becomes of no benefit to anybody else. Why do these people boast as if their gift of tongues? Why do they boast about themselves as being more spiritual? Well, it's because of their immaturity, isn't it? They want to make something of themselves and have no interest in building up the church. This, of course, isn't exclusive to tongues. We can do it with anything. We already saw back in chapters 8 to 10 that they're they're doing it with their knowledge of the truth, that there is one God and one Lord Jesus Christ, 
and they're boasting as if somehow having that knowledge makes them superior to those who are still brand new in the faith and still trying to work out how the universe works. Do you ever pack up the chairs after Sunday mornings, morning tea, and then go and boast to everybody about what a great job you did? Do you ever hear Emma boasting about what an amazing job she did of cleaning the toilets for us? I get so sick of it when she does that. (laughs) She never says anything like that, does she? She just quietly and humbly serves us all. And so today I'll stand here and I'll boast about Emma and about all of you in the way you love and serve each other through the use of your gifts in speaking and in music and in morning tea and in greeting people at the door and leading our kids in Sunday school, all of us loving each other and the body being built up as a whole. It's a glorious thing. And so he goes on, "Uh, So it is with yourselves. If with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into the air. There are doubtless many different languages in the world and none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker and the speaker a foreigner to me. And this little line at the end here is really the tragedy of what's going on in the church in Corinth. Foreigners to each other. Those of us that have been given to each other To be one body in Christ, have become strangers to each other because we don't even speak the same language. We're building ourselves up instead of having any desire to build up one another. So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Knowledge puffs up. Love builds up. And there's a danger that even the gifts which are given for the common good can be used to puff up the individual rather than to build up the church as a whole. I'm going to skip down to verses 19 and 20 where uh, Paul says this. In the church I would rather speak five words in my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. Paul is really pointing us back to the previous chapter when he spoke very diplomatically, referring to himself, but was really rebuking the Corinthians when he said, When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. Paul is encouraging the Corinthian Christians to grow up, to live in love instead of the pursuit of self-glorification. And God is calling us through this same word still today to grow up, each individually, living in the wisdom of God which expresses itself ultimately in this self-sacrificial love which builds up each other, which builds up the church as the body, which which has been sanctified by the blood of Christ, glorified in the works of love with which he clothes us, so that we collectively are then presented to Christ as his bride, so that we might be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Let's pray. Uh, Father, thank you that you are so full of mercy. Help us to know as we ought to know as those who are known by you. Father, you, you know me. You know my sinfulness. You know my brokenness. You know my weaknesses and my failings. 
and you come to me in grace. You wash me of my sin by the blood of Christ. You bring me into a new covenant relationship through that blood. You then fill my heart with your spirit and cause me to cry, Abba, Father, and Jesus is Lord. And you begin this lifelong work of teaching me and training me and rebuking me and correcting me and and conforming me into the image of your Son. And Father, I know that I am still so far short of what you would have me be. But I can stand here today and I can look back at my life and I can say with all confidence, all my life you have been faithful. And I can look forward and say with that same confidence, all my life you will be faithful. And your faithfulness will even endure beyond this life because I know because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that there's a glorious day coming when I will stand in your presence, when all the rubbish of my life will be burnt away once and for all. And I will stand there glorified. When we see him, we will be like him, for we will see him as he truly is. So, Father, keep working on me, keep working on all of us individually, helping us to grow and mature, teaching us how to love self-sacrificially so that your church might be built up and mature. And then present us as a church to unite us to Christ so that in that unity you would help us to be fruitful, that we would be prophets knowing your word and speaking your word to a world that is lost and dying and without hope so work in us by your spirit for this purpose and for your glory we pray in jesus name amen